All right. So, hey, before I get started today, I want to say th a special thank you to Austin Tullis. Austin is last Sunday with us today. He has been filling in, of course. I'm not done. Quit. Um, <laughs> interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> Austin, you've done an amazing job, and you've been flexible and humble, and he is extremely talented. And, uh, and I have enjoyed uh, every Sunday of working with him, which has been two because uh, while Aaron's been gone, I've been on my study break. But uh, Austin, uh, we hope you, you come back anytime. You're always welcome here, you and your family. Thank you so much. Now you can clap, all right? <laughs> all right. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Uh, the problem with uh, having a uh, five weeks to study is, um, man, I got a lot to talk about today. So it'll be a 15-minute intermission between the second and third point. <laughs> you can get something to eat and use the restroom. Uh, listen, uh, kidding, sort of. Uh, I don't know of any church today that has more people walking through the doors than they did uh, prior to the dumpster fire that was 2020. Um, we went through a lot in that year and are still dealing with some of the ramifications and the, the results and the consequences of, of that year. And, um, and so... Uh, Churches took a hit. Uh, depending on the location, I know churches that are still operating at about 10% to 25% less than what they were pre-pandemic. Now, the, the temptation has been for us to look at that and say, you know, it was all about COVID, and uh, we thought for a while that as soon as that all calmed down and, and everything kind of got past that, everybody would come back, right? But they haven't because we're still there. A lot of churches are still there. I don't know anybody that's grown like pre-pandemic numbers. Nobody's higher than that right now. Uh, us included, right? Uh, we're in a good spot. We're in a very healthy spot, but everybody took a hit. Um, and so the, um, the, the idea is we wanted to blame, you know, COVID. We wanted to blame the pandemic. And we thought, you know, if we hadn't had a pandemic, we'd just be humming along like normal and everything would be great. I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I think more and more of us are coming to the realization that what the pandemic did, it didn't dislodge people. It didn't send people away. It just accelerated what was already happening. We have been in a state of decline. And when I say we, I mean we collectively as the church, the evangelical church. We have been in a state of decline since 2007. Now, we don't want to notice this. We don't want to acknowledge it. But we've been in a state of decline since 2007. And what happened in the pandemic was it disrupted just enough people to accelerate them leaving the church. But most people are coming to the realization those people were gone anyway. They were going to be gone in three to five years had we not had the pandemic. But what the pandemic did was it just sped that whole process up. So what was for a long time a very slow leak kind of became a, a blowout. And a lot of people uh, just kind of left and they, they didn't come back because they weren't engaged well enough in the first place. And so we, we look at this and, and we, we, we want to we want to try to wrap our minds around the reasons why. Why have we for so long been losing people? Why are we losing ground year after year? Um, we know that in the coming years, uh, if, the, if the, all the polls and the studies tell us that they're correct, that, that young Americans will be leaving the church in droves. Now, our tendency uh, has been to, to shift blame into a lot of different places, right? We, we look at that and we, really there's no shortage of reasons for the decline and there's a lot of complex reasons for the decline. There's not, there's not a simplistic reason for the decline. Uh, and let's be honest, we own a lot of that responsibility for the decline. There have been several times where the church and Christianity, we have shot ourselves in the foot and, uh, and we've been the, at least part of the reason for the decline. And so we find ourselves as Christians in a world that is more and more inhospitable to faith and uh, more and more hostile to faith. And, and we look around and we hear all the negative press and we see all the bad polling and we know that people are leaving and we, it's easy for us to get really discouraged and to feel very defeated. And, uh, and we might even look around and we might be tempted to say that, you know, we have it worse than anyone. Right? If you look at the history of the church, right, there has never been a more hostile time than our time now. If you consider the things that we're talking about as a culture, the things we're struggling with as a culture. And, uh, and we think there's never been a, a more difficult time to be a Christian, more difficult time to lead a church, to be in church than any other time in history. But that's simply not true. 
In fact, there are, have been several generations where Christians have faced worse and they have endured more. This is not the first time where Christianity has found itself in a hostile and harsh environment. This is not the only time in history when people of faith have found themselves confronted with an unfriendly culture. This all started when I stumbled across a little book by a historian uh, whose name is Larry Hurtado. And, the, and the, it was the title of the book. And it turns out this little book was actually a, the, the, the text of a lecture that he gave. And uh, the text, I mean, the, the title of the book was, Why on Earth Did Anyone Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? And he proposed this really crazy idea that I'd never really thought of before, but that's kind of what started this whole thing for me. Uh, there were two realities that he talked about that seemed to be opposed to one another, two realities that should not have been able to coexist. Okay, reality number one. In the first 300 years, Christianity grew at an unheard of pace. We'll talk about that more in just a minute, okay? But for the first 300 years, you had Christianity growing and spreading in a very unheard of, astounding rate of growth. Fact number two, in the first 300 years, becoming and being a Christian came with an incredible and often painful cost. Those first 300 years, there was an intense opposition to Christianity. And that intense opposition meant that there oftentimes was an enormous financial, social, relational, and occasionally a physical cost that came with becoming or being a Christian. So Christianity experienced spectacular growth in a season in which it was exceptionally difficult and even painful to become a Christian. Why is that? Because in those first 300 years, Christianity was not looked upon as being simply harmless. Not, we were not viewed as being kind of odd or eccentric. Christianity was a threat. It was labeled as being dangerous. Let me kind of unpack that for you. Even though Christians then and hopefully today, we still continue to, to try to live quietly, quietly and peacefully in our culture, in that world, and I think we're seeing a little bit of it even in our world today, Christians and their views and their beliefs were considered to be a destabilizing force that jeopardized everyone's security, everyone's way of life. Christianity began in a world in which worship and religion was, was a part of probably every corner of everyone's life. There were, it was inescapable. It was pervasive. Worship in that world was not confined to one day or to one place. Every social, professional, political, and even recreational event included some element of ritual activity or worship. So there were gods that protected your home. There were gods that provided for your country. Uh, there, there were gods that watched over um, your, your family. Right? There, there were gods that, that were even assigned to specific professions. Like your profession had a god, a patron god, and you were expected to honor that god in the hopes that that god would make your work prosperous. If you attended a meal, it doesn't matter how formal or informal the meal was, there was going to be in that meal some sort of ritual or some kind of sacrifice you were expected to participate in. In fact, it was not uncommon for someone to invite you to a meal, and the invitation was not, was not coming from the person who was, who was putting on the meal. A lot of times the invitation was in the name of the God around the meal, the, who, who the meal was meant to honor. So the God himself was inviting you to this social event. Now, everybody in that world was allowed to have their own personal God, but no one, no one was allowed to limit their worship to that one God. But that is what set Christianity at odds with their culture. Christianity, Christians believed in one God, and they were allowed to worship that God and that God alone, in their eyes, all of these other rituals, all these other sacrifices that were part of all the different parts and pieces of life, they weren't just harmless. They were considered idolatrous, which if you think about it, what is idolatry? It's, it's in essence, 
What the Christian believed was it was spiritual adultery. It was the Christian being unfaithful to the God who had proven himself faithful to, to them. And so they refused to play along. And this refusal to play along, right, to recognize and to honor any other God but their own wasn't just considered to be insulting. It was, it was thought to be dangerous, dangerous to everyone, not just to them personally, but dangerous to all of society. See, these, these, this was a world in which all this worship that was going on, remember, it's, it's a world full of worship. It's a world very religious. But all of the worship that was going on in that world was transactional. Right? That's all it was, is I brought my offering, I made my sacrifice, and I participated in order so that I could, I could win that God's favor, and that God would continue to protect me or provide for me, right? So that's, that's really the only, that was the extent of the relationship with, between the gods and, and humanity, is we just tried to bring enough sacrifice, make enough offerings in order to keep the gods happy, or at least so that they would just leave us alone. And it was all transactional. So if you didn't, if you didn't enter into the transaction, what that meant was you risked angering that God. And if you angered that God, whatever God it may be, whether it was the God of the house or the, the nation or the God of your profession, if you angered that God, you risked losing their protection, their provision, and their prosperity. So let's kind of play this out. If you worship or you refuse to worship the God of your city or you refuse to worship the God of your country, people would look at you as if you were a traitor. Why is that? Well, because you were doing something that was possibly or could possibly provoke the anger of that God and you were putting all of us at risk, right? Can you imagine the peer pressure that would, that would include? Like you refuse to honor that God and you refuse to worship to that God and everybody's looking at you like, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Why are you putting us all at risk because of your convictions, right? Because if we don't worship him, he might withdraw his favor, Let's think about it like as, a, as, a, as a profession. If you were a part of a profession, let's say you were a carpenter, you typically belong to a guild. Um, a guild was kind of like a, an ancient form of a union. You, weren't, you were only able to, to ply your trade if you were a part of a guild. Well, every guild had a god. Every guild had a patron god. And, and when you met together in the carpenter's guild... Uh, you were going to make an offering to that God so that God would then bless your work and you would all be prosperous. But here you show up as a Christian and you go to the guild meeting and you refuse to, to participate in that worship. Well, everybody's looking at you and they're thinking you're risking all of our prosperity. You're risking everyone's financial stability because of your conviction. If you are a Christian or became a Christian, and you refused to honor the God of your household. Can you imagine the intense pressure and the conflict it created with the other people of your home? Because now suddenly you're not going to you're not going to participate in this in this worship anymore. Now you're putting everyone in your home at risk. So the refusal to worship any other God but their own meant that it was virtually impossible for Christians to be welcomed into any public gathering or to any professional setting. I'm going to give you some quotes from some writers of that time to so you get an idea of what was being said and what was being thought about Christians in this world. The first is a guy named Sellus, who was a Greek writer. Sellus wrote uh, in opposition to Christianity, and he, he argued that that when Christians question the validity of the gods, the gods upon which the social and political order rested, he argued that they were guilty of promoting sedition. And he said this, this is why they were so afraid of Christianity, why they, why they had to intensely oppose Christianity. If masses of people will follow the Christians in their madness... This will provoke the wrath of the gods and the social and political order would fall into anarchy and chaos. So as a Christian, what that meant was your stubborn refusal to honor any other God but your own meant that you were going to jeopardize the social stability and the financial prosperity of everyone around you. So because of this idea, Christianity wasn't just odd, it wasn't just eccentric, it wasn't harmless, it was dangerous. 
Another guy named Tacitus wrote that Christians were hated for their abominations and that they were spreading a deadly, dangerous superstition. Another writer by the name of Sustonius said it was a, described Christianity as a new and wicked superstition. Now I bring that up because that word superstition was a loaded word in that world because when you labeled something as a superstition, it was incredibly derogatory, incredibly insulting because it was a category of religion that was viewed as excessive, as repellent, and monstrous. That's how they describe Christianity. Christianity was an excessive, repellent, monstrous religion. It was dangerous. It was a dangerous and destabilizing force, which meant it could not be dismissed and it could not be ignored. It had to be aggressively confronted and opposed. And this meant that it created massive social, professional, relational, and even financial problems for every follower of Jesus. Now, you would think, with all of that going on, right, all of that happening, you would think that the, the trouble you would have invited, willingly invited into your life by even considering Christianity would have discouraged most reasonable people from even considering the claims or the message of Christ. But it didn't. I'm going to give you some, some numbers here. And let me be real clear. Everybody's, everybody's very honest about this. These are all guesses, right? There wasn't a, a, this is just kind of seeing what's being written about, what's being done, what's happening in that world. Uh, but these are all approximate numbers. So at the end of Jesus' time on the earth, you have the resurrection. Of course, there's the crucifixion, right? Then you have the resurrection. And then after the resurrection, 40 days, you have what's called the ascension. And Jesus leaves. And when he leaves, he leaves a small small band of believers. How many people are left at that time? Well, they estimate after the ascension, there are probably about 500 believers. That's it. Now, over the course of today, we'll have just a little over 500 people that will walk through the doors of our church. Right, that's all. That's, that's the sum total of Christianity in the entirety of the world. 500 believers. About 70 years later, in AD 100, that number has grown to seven to 10,000. Fast forward another 100 years, 280, and you're talking about 200,000 plus. And then another 100 years, by 380, you're talking about five to six million Christians throughout the world. Christianity, at this time, was not the only new religion. It was not the only new cult. It was not the only new spirituality of its time. Another historian said this, no other cult in the empire grew at quite the same speed. Part of the reason that Christianity spread like it did was because Christianity was unlike all the other ones. It was what they call, it became something called translocal and transethnic. Most cults or religions were centered in a certain location or they were centered among a certain people. Now, a lot of the things that Christians taught, the Jews have been teaching for thousands of years. Why didn't they get in trouble? Because the Greeks look at the Jews and they said their beliefs were based on their ethnicity, so they were given a pass. But then Christians start showing up and these people who were not Jewish start taking on the belief of Christians and so it becomes transethnic. It, it transpired. It goes past the, the Jews, right? And so you have, it begins there largely with the Jews, but then it grows Outside of that, that didn't happen in that day, and it typically didn't spread around the world or the known world as we know it like, like Christianity did. Now, you'd think that the, the growth of the church, particularly in the, in the third century, right, that the growth of the church would be the result of the fact, of the fact that there's, there's more, more Christians because there's less persecution, right? Wrong. Uh, the most intense season of persecution, where a lot of Christians lost their lives for their faith, actually occurred in 303 AD under the rule of Diocletian. It, it, honestly, it was persecution's last gasp because what happens? Ten years later, you have what's called the Edict of Milan, and that's where it says Christianity can now be tolerated in the Roman Empire. And then ten years after that, Constantine, the first Christian emperor, uh, declares that Christianity is the official religion of Rome. Think about that. In 300 years, Christianity has done what no one else has been able to do. Christianity has conquered the Roman Empire. Some people look at that and they say, well, the reason Christianity flourished is because eventually those in power allowed it to flourish. 
That's not true. Larry Hurtado, I'm going to quote this guy a lot today, but Larry Hurtado, the historian, says, Christianity did not become successful through Constantine giving it imperial approval. Instead, Constantine adopted Christianity likely because it had already become so successful despite earlier efforts to destroy the movement. Some people look at that and yeah, it looks like Constantine's faith was genuine, but it became politically expedient for him to make Christianity the, the official religion of Rome because everybody was becoming Christian. It was growing that fast. So the question that is, right, the question we have to ask is what was it that made Christianity so attractive? What was it that made Christianity so appealing? What was it that Christianity offered that made it worth the cost? Hurtado writes, there must have been features of, early, of the early Christian faith that made it not only distinguishable but also worth the consequences involved in taking it up. What was it that made it so appealing? Even though you stood to lose so much, financially, physically, relationally, professionally, why were people still willing to give up so much to adopt the Christian message? There's a lot of speculation, but generally there are three things that people come back to, three themes that they, they begin to orbit around. And those are the themes, the themes that we're going to be talking about over the course of this series. What were those three things that made Christianity so appealing? It was an unusual theology. It was an unexpected eternity. And it was an unconventional society. Now, why is this important for us today? We've got a good history lesson so far, but why is this, what does this matter to us? Let me tell you why it matters. It's important to us to understand these things because what made Christianity appealing then are the same things that make Christianity appealing now. And yes, the culture, the, the world that we live in today is much different than it was 2,000 years ago. I get that. But there are some really interesting parallels between what the world was believing in and how they saw and defined gods and the gods of that day and how we continue to do that today. So the things that made Christianity appealing then, I believe are the things that we can still lean into for it to be appealing and attractive now for us to come back to, to understand. So we're going to start today. What is it? The first one. It'll, the first thing is, and this is where it all begins. Everything takes its cues from this one. And it is an unusual theology. Everybody in that world, remember, they're all very religious. They all have multiple gods that they are worshiping from. They have not only one theology, but they have multiple theologies, right? What is a theology? Just in case you don't know. A theology is the study of God. Uh, a, th a theology is when you try to understand the nature of God, uh, the attributes of God, the personality of God. What is God like? Really, that's the question that theology tries to answer. What is God like? How am I supposed to relate to God? That's why we have theology. That's what theology is. And so Christianity comes in, and when it appears on the scene, it has a very unusual theology. So most of us in this room, uh, we have a theology to some degree. Right? We, we, we have some things we know about God, things that we believe about God. And those things that you and I know or believe about God, particularly for those of you in the room, and this is not everybody, I get it, but those of you in the room who have been a Christian for a while, you have a, a, probably have, over time, you've developed a, a fairly, you know, strong theology, right? Uh, picked up a little here and there, and some of you actually gone to school for it, right? You have a pretty strong theology. Now, here's the thing we have to deal with, the things we have to recognize, and if we can't recognize this, then I'm not sure this will have much of an impact on any of us. We have to recognize that the things that we know, the things that we believe about God have become so familiar to us. They are so normal to us that we have forgotten just how abnormal the Christian God was in a world full of gods. Let me say it again. We have forgotten just how abnormal the Christian God was in a world full of gods. Larry Hurtado wrote another book called Destroyer of Gods. And it's talking about the Christianity's influence over the world and, 
and, uh, and the religious belief of that world. And he says early Christianity, he describes it as being odd. Early Christianity was bizarre. Early Christianity did not fit religion for people then. But it was the very features of early Christianity that made it odd and objectionable in ancient Rome that have now become the unquestioned assumptions about religion in much of the modern world. And then he, he says this, and this is what's important. He says, we likely do not realize how unusual or even odd these notions once were. We don't realize how weird Christianity was in this world when it first appeared. In fact, when, when Christianity first appeared, one of the labels that Christians were given because they refused to worship all of the gods in the whole pantheon they only worshiped one God. Christians were labeled atheists because we wouldn't worship all the gods. We only chose one God. So we were given the call of, or the title of atheist, right? Because we, the Christianity, Christian religion did not fit what religion was for people then. Now we might assume that, that one of those odd or unusual teachings about God was that he was the only God. One of the things that made Christianity distinguishable was kind of this arrogant Christian belief that there was only one God who ruled over the whole universe. But here's what's interesting. The Greeks and the Romans had hundreds of gods, and each of one of those gods had their own jurisdiction, right? They had their own territory, and they ruled over their their. their their areas with their power and their influence, but it was limited to their, their, their assigned domains, right? The gods of a house uh, and the gods of a country, the gods of a profession. We've already talked about that. But in my reading, I was surprised to learn that this idea of the existence of one supreme being, the idea of the existence of one ultimate deity was not truly unusual. Yes, there were lesser gods that the people worshiped, but there were a lot of thinkers and different philosoph schools of philosophy that actually speculated, they, they hypothesized that there was one God kind of behind and, and beyond all the other gods, that there was one ultimate God over them all, that there was one divine supreme being from which everything, even all the other little gods, originated from. But here's what's interesting. It never went beyond speculation. No one ever named this god. No one ever built a temple to this god. And why was that? Well, because they assumed that if such a god did exist, that god was so great, that god was so big, he was so supreme, that god was so transcendent, he would have been unknowable. So there was no point in trying to understand him. This God, this one supreme being would have been so unapproachable that it would have been useless to make sacrifice to him. And this God was so disconnected and so distant, he wasn't even offended by the fact that humanity didn't recognize or worship him because he could care less. He had zero interest in humanity. So he was so detached, he did not need and had no concern for the people in the world. None whatsoever. But then what happens is, the Christian message appears on the scene, and they start talking about a God. A God who is every bit as great, a God who is every bit as supreme, who is every bit as transcendent, who is every bit as powerful as the gods of the Greeks and the Romans all speculated about, right? The one God from which everything comes from, the one creator of all things. And the Christians are saying, we know this God. And they start talking about this one God over all things. And so they're, they're saying, some of this lines up with what you're already, what you, what you, what you assume but yet he's different. See, he's every bit as great, but he's also good. And he's every bit as infinite, but he's also radically, surprisingly intimate. And we get a picture of this from, from Paul. Now, Paul, if you don't know Paul, uh, he became a Christian a few years uh, after uh, the church started 
he was a Pharisee. And for a while, his only job was to try to crush Christianity, but he was doing it for the Jews at the time. See, nobody liked Christians, Jews or Gentiles, Greeks or Jews. Everybody was against them. Paul was on the Jewish side of the team, and he was trying to crush the church. And then Jesus uh, wrecks his life, and he becomes a Christian. A very dramatic conversion. He becomes a Christian. And not only does he become a Christian, he goes out, and he is now spreading the message of the gospel, the message of God's love for humanity and the world. But his audience are the Greeks and the Romans, the very people we're talking about. He is going out talking to those people. And so there's this scene in Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens, right? Right there in the heart of, of kind of philosophy. And, and it's like a giant Greek think tank, right? All the theories and all the things are being tossed around in Athens. And uh, he, he's at a place called the Areopagus. And the Areopagus was a place where everybody kind of gathered and they had all these, they worshiped and they, they debated and they learned and, you know, all this stuff, right? So Paul is there and he's going to now, he's going to preach the gospel to these Greeks and Romans in this place, in the Areopagus. And he stands up and listen to what he says. He says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. That's what we just talked about, right? Religion is everywhere in this world. There's not a corner of life where you won't find religion. He says, you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, there are all these different altars and, and idols. He said, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Maybe this was that God that they were speculating about. Maybe this was the God they hypothesized was that God behind all the gods, right? And he says this, he says, so you are ignorant Talking about this unknown God, you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. You don't even know this person. But this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. He says, basically, you don't know this God? Let me introduce you to him. And what does he say? He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he is himself... He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So what is he saying? He is affirming all these things that they believe about this one supreme being, right? He is a God. He is real. He is transcendent. He is distant, right? He does not need anything from you. He is not served by any work of your hands. So yeah, you got all of that right. But there's some things you got wrong. See, there's one massive difference between these two gods. See, unlike this God of the unknown, this Christian God, he's not disconnected from the world. He's not disinterested in the world. This Christian God is actively at work in the world. And that's where Paul goes next. Look at verse 26. He goes, talking about the activity of this God, he says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. What is he saying here? He's saying God is involved. God is involved in kings and kingdoms, in borders and people, right? He is moving the pieces on the board around. He's not disconnected. He's not distant. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's supreme. He is above all other gods, but he is not removed. He is actively at work in the world. And then he goes on and he portrays this God who is moving in the world, he is portraying a God who is involved in the world, who is active in the affairs of the world, and he can anticipate the question of his audience. And this is what Paul does great. He always knows what question they're thinking of, and he, he always addresses it before they can even ask it. And their question is, why would a God that great, why would a God that big, why would a God that supreme, why would a God like that ever be concerned about the affairs of man? Why would a God so great, descend so far to be involved in our world? And he answers that question starting in verse 27. He said, God did this so that, right? This is why God is moving in the world, so that they would, look at this, seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Because though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Why is God 
moving in the world? Why is God active in the world? Why is God concerned about kings and kingdoms and the affairs of men in this world? Because he is working so that people might seek him. And why does he want them to seek him? Because what does God want? He wants a relationship with the people of this world. And these Greeks are like, this is incredible. They've never seen or heard anything like this. So you have a God, like the one they thought about, like the one they speculated about, a God who is not served by human hands, but who at the same time is actively working in the world to capture human hearts. Why would he do that? Paul alludes to it, but doesn't say say it explicitly. Why is God doing this? What's the motive behind God's work in the world? What is the motive behind God's activity in the world? Why does God want us to seek him out and to find him? Why? Because he loved the world and the people in it. Here's our problem. You and I read the words, for God so loved the world, and we barely raise an eyebrow doesn't really touch us, doesn't really move us, doesn't quicken our, our pulse. But think about those words in that world. Think about those words in a world where there is a supreme God, but he doesn't care about you. There's a supreme God, but he's completely disinterested. You have nothing to offer him. He doesn't even care if you worship him or not because he's so far removed from you. And then, and then John comes along and says, for God so loved the world, and that is to the Greeks and the Romans mind bending. When the ancient writers wrote about the love that the gods had for the for the for humanity, right? They they always chose one specific word. If a god had any affection for a human, it was always the Greek word philia, right? Or philia. How depending on how you say it, right? Phileo or philia, right? And it's, it's the word for friendship, right? It communicated kindness. It communicated friendliness, right? If the gods had any feelings for humanity, this was the specific word they choose. It was, um, uh, they, were, they were amicable, but not accessible, right? They were, um, they were cordial, but unapproachable. It was really kind of like the lowest level of affection, really, Right, it um, it was kind of a lukewarm, milk toast kind of love. All right, let me let me see if I can illustrate this in another way, gentlemen. Let me talk to you guys. Cause I don't know about you girls, but guys, um, you remember that you remember that time you had that crush, right? That girl that she just stole your heart, and you, man, you were flirting and you were doing your kid, your best to get noticed, and and uh, you were kind of working the friend network, right? You know trying to make sure she understood your interest in her. And finally, man, you just went out there. You, you laid it all out on the line. You became super vulnerable, and you just said, I like you. I like you. And then she, she looks at you and says the worst thing you've ever heard. I like you, but as a friend. <laughs> oh. You can tell I've heard that a lot, right? <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> There's a lot of baggage there with that, right? I I was a lot of my life right there, right? I like you, but as a friend, you know, I don't want that. I don't want that. It's not what I'm interested in, right? That's what the gods were essentially saying, right? They're bringing all their sacrifices. They're bringing all their worship, and the gods are in their heaven looking down going, ah, we like you, but as a friend. I didn't love the people. They weren't interested or intimate with them. But then Christians began writing. And what's interesting in in Christian literature, early Christian literature, when Christians began to describe and to defend their faith through their words, the Christians reached out and they took a word off the shelf that was never previously used in relationship to the gods and humanity. And it was the word agape. It was the unconditional, passionate, emotional, perfect love, an unending, loyal love that did not matter what you had done or who you were or where you came from. It was a love that was not earned and it could not be deserved. Nobody had ever seen that, but suddenly you have all this Christian literature and this word agape just explodes across all these scrolls and all this writing. 
Because that's the best word they had for the kind of love that God had for his, his people. So here's a God, right? This unusual theology. Here's a God who is every bit as great and every bit as supreme and every bit as transcendent is a God who does not need humanity, but yet for some inexplicable reason still loved humanity and actually actually went to the, to the lengths of demonstrating that love for humanity by descending into the world, by becoming human so that he himself could pay the penalty of humanity's sin through his death on the cross. Guys, on a good day, the gods of the Greeks and the Romans, they just left you alone. But this Christian God, man, this was something else. This was something new. This Christian God was every bit as great, but he was actively involved in the world and interested in its people. Why? Because he was working to get their attention, and he actually entered the world so that he could bring them salvation. It's a God who loves and who loves you. Now, remember Paul. Paul wrote and ministered to all these Greeks and Romans who did not understand this theology, who, didn't, who couldn't comprehend this kind of love. This kind of God was absurd. It was ridiculous. But I want to read a passage to you that you might have heard before, but I want you to listen to it with the ears of one of these Greeks or Romans. I want you to hear this like, you're, like they're hearing this for the first time. Paul writing to this church in a place called Ephesus, and he says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people, listen, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. He says, I am praying that you grasp this knowledge of how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And why is that? Because they didn't come to it naturally. It wasn't something they grew up with. It wasn't something common or familiar. And he's saying, I am praying that you can just lay hands on this because if you get this, it changes everything. It changes you. It changes the world. This is a love unleashed. This is a love that transforms so when you read, you read this, and this is, this is again, this is, this is evidence of how familiar this is to us. We read grasping God's love. Why do I need to grasp? I got it. I understand it. These people didn't. He wanted them to see it. He needed them to know it because knowing it changes everything. Now let's take five minutes, five minutes, and make some parallels and, and draw some application. What do we do with this now? Where do we go from here? 2,000 years ago, people were highly religious, Right? Very religious, very spiritual. Guys, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. We live in a world that is highly spiritual. And you know what they did in that world? In their spirituality, they created gods for themselves, gods that that they fashioned really kind of after their own images, gods that was interesting, gods that only wanted what they wanted to bring and gods that would only do what they wanted to do. Right? And what do we have today? It's the same thing. We have people exercising toxic autonomy. And we are creating our own gods because we're no less spiritual than we've ever been. It looks a little different, but so much of it is the same. We are still a highly spiritual people, still creating gods that we can worship. And when we do that, we, we create gods that fall into one of two camps. Either that God is distant and disconnected and uninterested in us and we are uninterested in them and we could could care less about either one, right? Or we create gods who we try to transact with. We try to earn their love. We try to earn their favor. And really it's more about, it is a superstition. Like if I just do the right thing and bring the right thing and say the right thing and am the right person, that God will bless me and I will be prosperous and I'll be secure, right? But the problem is this, is that what the gospel is, the gospel completely upends all of that because the gospel says there is a great God of the universe who loves you, a great God of the universe who flung all the stars across the sky, but also knows how many hairs you have on your head. That's amazing. 
And that God entered into this world not because you earned it or deserved it. That God loved you not because you were good and moral. He loved you even when you did not love him. That is the God who loves. And if that idea, if that knowledge, if that truth could penetrate your heart, if you can have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, that changes everything. And that's where we have to start. Is it old and tired? Is it familiar and cliche? Yeah, maybe it sounds like it, but it's only because we're not seeing it as it's meant to be seen. My prayer all week long has been that God would break through the crust of your experience and you would see him and feel him and experience his love, his real, genuine, passionate, affectionate, involved love for you in a way that you haven't ever or you haven't in a long time. That you reconnect with his love in a way you haven't or you haven't in a long time. So we, we cut a song out of the first part of the set so that we could, we could sing this song as we go today. We're gonna worship as we close. We're, we're gonna respond in worship today based on the things that you heard and what we've talked about. And I asked Austin last week to introduce this song so that we would have a little bit of familiarity with this song because I want us to respond to God through the lyrics of this song. So I'm gonna invite you to worship. And I want these words to penetrate your heart. I want these words to wash over you. I want you to feel and sense these words as if you've never heard them before. Let's pray. Before we go, a couple things. Number one, uh, this might be something that's new to you. You've heard this before, but you heard it in a way you've never heard it before today. And it's, it's prompted a need to respond. You need to do something with this. What do you do with it? A couple of ways I want to point it to you. Stop by the Next Step Station and let's have a conversation, right? If you want to know more about what it means to know and to follow Jesus, you want to know more what it means that God loves you and how that's even possible, let's have a conversation and, and we can start that conversation at the Next Step Station or maybe an easier way to do that. Just give us a way to contact you on the Connect card. Then at the bottom it says, I'm interested in, and there's different responses there. Whatever response best fits your situation, check that box, drop it in, and we'll be in touch with you to set up a time where we can meet and talk and take a next step with you, okay? Let's give us the privilege of doing that. Think about that before you leave, okay? All right. So until we meet again, seek the Lord through His Word. Pray to the Lord by His Spirit. Tell the Lord with your words. Glorify the Lord in your work. Until we meet again, live your life this week for the same reason that Jesus gave His. All together for the life of the world.